Step three here is, you know, device OPC and MQTT security. Traditionally, PLC native device communication protocols don't support encryption. They don't support certificates. They don't even support authentication. And so best practice has been to pull these devices from as close on the network as possible. And these have often been kept on isolated controls, OT networks. And then when the data needs to be collected across a broader network, you, you run into problems and you have to do all this pass through and all this stuff. And it, you, know, you have all this middleware that can come into play and it can make your architecture kind of crazy. One thing to consider is edge gateways. They're becoming really popular these days. Certainly we have our own edge solutions for ignition that you can put in the field, they can pull locally, and then they can publish the data up over a more secure protocol, which can help bridge that gap across networks. Ignition can you know, provide a layer of separation between the OT or private and the IT public networks to make tags um, and ignition uh, available securely without exposing the devices behind the scenes. And direct connections from ignition to OPC UA and MQTT devices are generally the most easily secured connections, but we can still secure other connections as well. But talking about OPC UA, OPC UA and MQTT, let's go into those a little bit. Uh, so OPC UA provides built-in security at the server level and also embedded directly on a device. When you connect, you can choose the sign and encrypt security mode to ensure that all data sent over OPC UA will be encrypted. And the OPC UA communications also support user authentication. So make sure you use a strong password and don't forget to change passwords periodically as defined by uh, your organization's IT standards. And, you know, we talked about ICS cert and uh, different advisories that have gone out. There's been a lot of talk recently about default passwords, especially for OPC servers. So make sure you're changing yours. You know, when you install Ignition, there are default passwords and, and you should change those, even though we do default to requiring a certificate. Uh, to be approved for new connections. So it's not like somebody can just connect your OPC server willy-nilly using that password, but you should still absolutely change that. Another way other than OPC to transmit data is with MQTT. Uh, MQTT is a PubSub protocol. If you haven't heard of it, you should definitely go and learn more about MQTT. We have entire webinars dedicated to this topic, but essentially it transfers data from a, a transmitter, a publisher up to a broker, um, and then any application can subscribe to that broker. So you have publisher to broker and broker to subscriber. And all of that should be sent over TLS, SSL. MQTT also supports username and password authentication, as well as access control lists, ACLs, which limit user access based on a topic namespace. Uh, one of the great things about MQTT is that it can be hosted in the cloud, but certainly if you're gonna host it in the cloud, security measures should be implemented, You know whether it's local or, or in the cloud. And so, like I said, we talk a lot about MQTT and a lot of other webinars. Uh, I highly recommend you check those out. On to step four, identity and access management. When securing an application, you need to consider both authentication and authorization. So authentication is determining who's logging in, you know, who can get onto the system. So often this is usernames and passwords, you know, and then authorization is once they've logged in successfully, what privileges do they have? What can they do once they're logged in? So to look at these two concepts within you know, the scope of Ignition, let's start with authentication. And so Ignition manages users and passwords through IDPs, which stands for identity providers. And we have a built-in IDP, but we can also connect to third-party IDPs such as Okta or Duo via SAML or OpenID Connect. But uh, the built-in Ignition IDP supports three main user sources. Internal authentication, meaning you just manage users and roles directly inside Ignition, or database authentication, or Active Directory authentication. The internal authentication, you know, is kind of just the default that you'd use. You'd manage all the users and roles inside Ignition directly. It can be really handy and really useful to use that uh, where it starts to breakdown is where you say, I have multiple gateways across my network and I want them all to have shared users that sign in and I don't wanna to have to manage the user separately on each gateway. And so then you can start looking at other options. And so one is database authentication, which uses an external database to store 
data and user management, um, and then all that's done with direct interaction with the database. And that database could be connected up to multiple ignition gateways. So now you have a single spot where you can manage users you know, across your network. But rather than just managing them in a database, often what we see are people using active directory authentication. And so the active directory authentication profile uses Microsoft's active directory over LDAP to store all users' roles and more to make up an authentication profile. And active directory groups are used for ignition's roles and user role mappings. When using an active directory user source, the administration of users and roles is through the active directory interface itself rather than managing them within ignition. So you know, it requires all modifications are done through Active Directory. Often that means that you're submitting a request to IT and then IT is making those changes. So it, it has pros and cons, but certainly it's it's beneficial to use Active Directory as now multiple gateways can all connect up to the same Active Directory um, and there's one single source of truth to go and update for all your users. Now the LDAP protocol specifically, there's a just like uh, you have HTTP or using SSL, you have HTTPS. Same thing applies to LDAP here. There's LDAP and there's LDAPS. LDAPS meaning it's encrypted, it's going over a secure port, all that kind of stuff. So to prevent snooping on authentication, encryption should certainly be implemented. Coming on to another point within internal authentication for our ITP, uh, in addition to just supporting the username and password, uh, we do support badge authentication as well. This is using RFID badges. And so when RFID is enabled, users do not have to enter their username and password, but instead have a physical badge in order to log in uh, to the client or session. And it's recommended that badge authentication method, the badge authentication method be enabled and set to default and badge secret, which means that in addition to having to scan their badge, they will also then have to type in their password. So you get a little bit of multi-factor authentication there. You don't have to, you can just use the badge or just use username and password, but uh, using them together both is, is certainly the most secure. You know, that's kind of Ignition's built-in IDP with those different user sources within that IDP. But what if your organization already has an IDP like Okta or Duo? Well, Ignition can leverage those for authentication as well. So utilizing a third party Identity provider can be really useful because it lets you utilize features that Ignition doesn't support natively, such as multi-factor authentication from push notifications or biometrics. And while IDPs were initially only available in perspective, uh, as of 8.1, they can be used throughout Ignition, including in the gateway, vision, and the designer. A couple general authentication suggestions here. When it comes to user accounts, a strong password policy should be defined, including password length and complexity requirements. So if a password, you know, so a password may need to include letters, numbers, special characters, things like that. You should also establish a password expiration schedule and uh, also quickly remove former user accounts, meaning when, you know, people leave the company, certainly you need to go disable those accounts quickly. And also that's why you should avoid using generic accounts. Don't have people all log in as operator. Uh, they should be logging in as John or Mike or whatever. And following the same line of logic, you know, these generic logins pose a security risk if auto login is enabled because uh, that's what a user launches um, a project. They're, they're granted a, a basic level of access. So auto login should be disabled and each user should have their own unique credentials. So you're logged in now, you're authenticated. Now it's time for authorization. Each user is granted privileges through the assignment of roles or security levels. So roles are customized during development and can be defined inside Ignition or mapped to Active Directory groups or to an IDP's attributes. Sometimes in addition to knowing who the user is, it's important to know where they're sending a command from. So security zones define an area of the network into these manageable zones that can have a security policy set on them. And so what this means really is that when somebody logs in, we can look at their domain name, their IP address, their subdomain, um, and we can grant them specific privileges based on that so that a user who is logging in on a device right next to a piece of equipment may have read-write control. They have line of sight. They can control that. That's great. But if they're logging in from their desk, that's a different IP address. We know they don't have line of sight. We don't want them to turn things on and off. So even though it's the same user, 
would have the same roles, they have a different level of access based on where they're logging in from. I mentioned security levels. Security levels are a, a new concept as of 8.0, but uh, security levels are a user set hierarchy that defines access permissions or roles inside a prospective session and now you know, throughout the rest of Ignition as well. And these provide a way to map user roles uh, defined from an identity provider to Ignition roles or to create your own custom security tiers. And with security levels, you get an inheritance model where more specific security levels means that you have more generic security levels above it. You know, this inheritance now means that you can set up a powerful permissions model where all employees can access a page in read-only mode, but only plant floor operator employees can read write. And since plant floor, uh, plant floor operators are employees, they can do everything under the employee's security level, plus the things that are under the plant floor operator you know, security level as well. So this inheritance means that, you know, you can just keep getting more detailed. A supervisor uh, may have more privileges, but they also have all the privileges of an operator and so on. And so you're not having to define it in multiple places. Another note here is that complex security level rules can be created using Ignition's expression language, uh, where a security level can be derived from the authentication or authorization context itself. This context can take into account who you are, uh, your logged in user identity, profile attributes, and so on, uh, where you are, your security zones that are assigned to you, and what roles you have. You can also take into account the current time of day in case users can only log into a system between the hours of 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Pacific, for example, um, et cetera. You're only limited by your imagination. So it can be really powerful here to write these expressions to you know, have even more granulated security. <laughs> 